Good morning, everyone. Settled in. So good morning. My name is Nancy Scola. I am a senior technology reporter at Politico, which is a publication based in Washington, DC. You see the logo behind me? Yep. Uh, it's my good fortune to moderate this morning's session on governing dual use technology. Those are tools and innovations uh, that were developed for consumer uses, but they can be repurposed for military applications. And that raises challenging questions about what sort of global rules and restrictions should be, should be applied to their sale and trade. Those questions become even more complex and this panel even more timely when we consider cutting edge technologies like artificial intelligence, robotics, and quantum computing. So what we're aiming to do today in the time we have remaining is figure out the best path forward for the world, no pressure, uh, when it comes to making sense of these technologies and their risks and rewards. And we have a terrific panel with us this morning to do just that. We're, we're keeping a seat warm for one of them, but he'll be arriving shortly. Uh, so we have David Shim. Uh, David is an associate pro pro professor at the Department of Aerospace Engineering at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, better known as CAST. Uh, we have Corey Shotke. Uh, Corey is the deputy director of the General International Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, she previously held several high-level posts in Washington, D.C., including on the White House's Na National Security Council, in the Pentagon, and the State Department. So we're going to talk for a while, uh, maybe 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions for the, from the audience uh, for the last 25 uh, minutes or so. So please be thinking about what you might want to ask our panelists. And with that, we'll get started. So Professor Shim, uh, countries have for decades placed restrictions on the trade of, so of so-called dual-use technologies from lasers to computer hardware. Uh, as we look now at this new age of artificial intelligence, we're seeing technologies that are remarkably flexible, scalable, and very often very cheap. How does that change this question of governing the sale and trade of dual-use technologies? So the uh, recently AI become a, you know, everyday word for everybody, but um, uh, the power of AI is very remarkable. So far, uh, we thought uh, human beings only uh, capable of making complex uh, decisions, but um, using the AI, we can uh, some of the part of delegate the decision making to the machines. So we already use it every day. For example, the iPhone, Apple introduced the Face ID, which is based on the uh, the facial recognition. Uh, same technology can be used for uh, some military application, uh, facial detection. Mm -hmm. I was uh, at a demonstration of the military armor vehicle like 10 years ago in Korea. And that they are demonstrating that the, uh, the armor vehicle is uh, stopped by the operators, mm -hmm. and then a uh, vehicle stops when detected. Uh, Speak up. Speak up? Yeah, okay. I think people are straining a bit. Okay, so, uh, so I, there's a little bit of an echo. Um, so I saw that a vehicle stops when detected people, but um, the, this is a military vehicle, so it's kind of cruel to say, but um, sometimes you have to go over okay. a military application, but then they stop. So. Uh, I thought, oh, this is wrong. We have to have detect uh, friend or enemy. But um, now we may be able to do that. We use the, uh, this kind of uh, facial detection to, to, to identify if they are the enemy or you know, the, the, the friend. So this is a wonderful example. We can use this technology just like that. But um, can we use it even beyond? You know, there was some controversial video Professor Russell made early that last year. And then in the, in the scene, there's a, a drone that detects the face. Mm -hmm. I actually, honest to say that uh, we have a very similar technology, not face, but the obstacle. So for AI, if you use a different data set, we can train for different targets. So what he made in the video is very, very possible these days. Maybe not at the scale, maybe not the accuracy, but we are getting there. So, so the technology always finds its way to the application if it's right, if it's doing the job. So it's very uh, hard to stop it right now. And the, those hardware is getting cheaper these days. Um, it used to be expensive. Still it's expensive running the big servers, but there are AI chips. Latest drones, really made by China, uh, the, like selling like 100 bucks. So they do have some recognition capabilities already. So these technologies are really getting out there. And once it's out, it's very hard to control. So we are really seeing the proliferation of this kind of technology. So we, I think this is really not right time 
in the place to talk about it. So the same fa facial recognition that you can, you look into your iPhone camera, it unlocks your phone. Right. That can be used, you're saying, to detect if yeah. a, an enemy combatant in right. sort of the military field. Exactly. Is there any limitation on the technology right now to make that sort of, to, to be able to do that analysis in the field? Or could you really strap an iPhone to the front of a... That's phone? a good question. I, I, in China, I was also told that um, China, they use uh, the facial ID for a credit card transaction. It's all that happening. I look it up and the iPhone has an error of a one millionth, which is quite remarkable for any AI system. Many, many typical papers, they say like a 97 percent, 90 some percent. So this is really possible. So, so for a machine, you know, in UN, we have a similar talk. With Professor Russell, I will go to the UN meeting, UNOG, the last meeting. And uh, they say we need to have a meaningful human control. And that's very uh, important keyword for that. But then for machines, they don't really care if this is for credit, credit card transaction or a firing a missile. So same technology can be used for detecting the aircraft. Actually, I'm, I'm really working on it. As an as aerospace uh, expert, I'm using AI to detect the aircraft and avoid. Mm -hmm. Same can be written in the, in the, but the very small minor changes that if you, for civil application, you detect the airplane, you avoid. In the military application, you use the same airplane you detect, go straight. Mm -hmm. So it's only a writing of a few lines of code in a different way. And the machine don't care if this is uh, saving people or killing people. It just executes the lines. Mm -hmm. so, so it's, it's just like that. Yeah. So Corey, as a, as a former policymaker at sort of the highest levels of the US government, when you hear that uh, iPhones have military capabilities, does that scare you? You know, I think we have a tendency to look at the scary futures, um, but we ignore all of the positive applications that are already going on and improving people's lives. Just to take the example from my home state of California, this is wildfire season, and drones flying over wildfires help not only firemen figure out where to target their resources, but also help uh, people understand if their house has been burned. And uh, so we think about the negative stuff. We think about the killer robots. Mm -hmm. We don't think about all of the ways that it will reduce friendly fire mm -hmm. uh, deaths in combat, for example, as the it, professor just mentioned. If you so yeah, I think we do have a tendency to overweight the scary negative outcomes. Yeah. The other thing is from a governance perspective, this ship has sailed. There, there is no effectual way to be able to uh, ban or limit these kinds of technologies. If you look at the, the spectrum of, of governance on weapons issues, mm -hmm. nuclear issues were pretty good as an international community in figuring out how to control, but they require enormous amounts of resources, very few inputs, so you can limit the inputs, large machinery. The technology essentially hasn't advanced since 1945. Mm -hmm. Even there, our international ability, we, we are still surprised by breakthroughs. They're few, but we're surprised. Yeah. Biological innovation, much harder than nuclear. Uh, because a lot of these come from the life science. They're self-propagating. Mm -hmm. um, and the knowledge base is constantly being updated. And if you go to information technologies, there it's so low cost. It's, the technology is ubiquitous. Everybody's mm -hmm. got a phone. Um, so, so the only effective way to control uh, dangerous applications is actually the ethics and professional standards of the developers. Okay, so the, the sort of main treaty that governs dual use technologies is called the Wassenaar Arrangement, it goes back to the 1990s, right, where we, we didn't have iPhones yet, right, mm -hmm. at that point. Uh, does that need to be updated, or are you arguing that there's just no way that any sort of uh, treaty or sort of global apparatus can cope with these technologies, so let's not bother? Well, I always think you should bother, and I would love to hear from folks in the audience any governance suggestions you have for getting a handle on this, because uh, my institute is running a project trying to look at what kind of arms control arrangements would we like to have in place before artificial intelligence completely uh, dominates the IT field. 
And we struggle to figure out what it is, so I'd love to know from folks um, who are listening what they would like to see included. It's, I think I am pessimistic that there's any conceivable way to do it because, again, the, the knowledge is ubiquitous, the machinery is ubiquitous, there's low barrier to entry, and there's so much interesting and positive that can be done. For example, the, the biggest resistance to putting biological um, or IT uh, arms control into place is from the scientists themselves mm -hmm. who see enormous possibilities for extending life, reducing Alzheimer's. Like, just the positive upside is so overwhelming mm -hmm. that I'm skeptical there's any, any productive governance that can be put in place. Okay. Uh, so, so our third panelist is going, I think, is going to be more skeptical about the, the sort of that, uh, <laughs> the argument that you make that, that we should be hands off on some of the governing. So we'll save that for I'm not saying bit. we should. I'm saying I don't see a practical way to do it. Okay. I'd love to see a practical way to do it. I would love, for example, for there to be some enforceability to the agreement that President Obama and President Xi made in 2015, that we would not target each other's critical infrastructure with IT, and that we would not um, use state espionage for commercial purposes. Mm -hmm. But without any enforceability, the only way you will find out whether potential adversaries have complied is when you see it rolled out in a conflict or not. OK. Um, so David, Corey mentioned the idea of uh, ethics among researchers on some of these new technology and innovations. There was an interesting situation recently where Google employees objected to the company developing technology for the US uh, Department of Defense to analyze uh, drone footage, basically. Uh, and the employee said, we don't want our work being put to these military uses. The company sort of resisted at first, and then they said, okay, we won't renew it going mm -hmm. forward. Is that a good outcome, or is that sort of an anti-progress uh, outcome? I think it's a, it's a good, good outcome. Uh, the, the engineers uh, use their uh, ethics and their morals and conscience to resist. So it's always hard to resist the boss's comments. So <laughs> uh, I think it is a very uh, a good thing to do that. The early part of technology is when you develop something, we develop it because it's good. And uh, it takes a lot of knowledge, a lot of effort to make it happen. So normally at the stage, it doesn't really happen. I've been, bad thing doesn't happen. I've been, I've been in the drone in research industry for an area for the last, what, 27 years. I started my work in 1991. So drone became a problem only recently, like 2013, 14, especially when DJI, you know, uh, sell this kind of amazing drone technology that everybody can, in this room, everybody can use. That's the reason why drone became so uh, popular. You can buy any normal markets these days, you know, with like a hundred bucks or something. So, but then that's the same time when pro a problem happens. Any, any people without good understanding, without, uh, without a very good moral standard, they start using it. So they strap bombs on it, they strap something weird on it, just fly off and do something bad. Mm -hmm. So this is, every technology has this kind of problem. And the, when the people worry about the AI, they worry about this. The AI used to be very expensive technology. Mm -hmm. You need the expensive servers to run this thing. You need the very, very high level, top level PhD understanding to do this. But now, you just download the uh, TensorFlow from Google. Even high school kids run the product. My son actually is a, seventh grade, he mm -hmm. was uh, running this uh, bird classification algorithm as just uh, after school activities. This is where problem starts. So and everybody can use it. That's what, uh, he's not here, hopefully he's coming with them. That's about <laughs> Professor Russell's <laughs> point, that once this thing's getting out there, people start using it without thinking about the cause and effect and thinking the consequences. Mm -hmm. And so sh should there be any, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna, uh, make a point about the Google case, which is an especially interesting one. So Google engineers rebelled at the prospect of uh, working on drone analysis for the Pentagon. And now, but that causes one to worry that societies that have um, active civil society and push back against government uses and military uses will be asymmetrically disadvantaged in warfare. Um, except for the fact that 
This is likely just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. So for example, I think it likely that there will be a backlash in Google against working on AI for the Chinese government mm -hmm. if they anticipate it will be used for censorship or for social credit scoring mm -hmm. or the kinds of things that the same kinds of engineers who would object to using drone foot to assisting drone footage analysis are likely to object to those things as well. So the argument would be that uh, countries in which employees mm -hmm. feel empowered to object to what their companies are working on may be that might be a burden on the sort of war fighting capabilities of those countries. It could be a disadvantage if you think it stops there, but it probably doesn't stop there. It probably means that the, the governance restriction on uses of artificial intelligence are gonna be scientists saying, whoa, wait, I don't wanna be involved in censorship. Whoa, yeah. wait, I don't wanna be involved in penalizing people in, in ways that a government I don't approve of wants to. Okay. There, so there's been a history of uh, this debate over the United States in particular selling computing equipment to other countries, right? So Ronald Reagan objected to the sale of uh, computers to, I believe it was the Soviet Union for uh, the, yeah, yeah, it was was, for uh, census purposes. I can check my notes, but it's... Is this, I'm sorry, it was actually the sale of computers to China for, the, for use in this country's census, and there was concerns that it would be put to military uses. President Ray, uh, Clinton wrestled with the same thing in the 1990s and allowed the sale of supercomputers also to China for weather predictions. Those computers, when you stack them up, up against the new technology that we're talking about now, quantum computing, which, how, do folks know what quantum computing is? It's sort of this, so the idea, actually, we have a computer scientist. <laughs> Can you define quantum computing for us? Well, I'm not a computer scientist, but I'm uh, interested in a lot of stuff. So um, quantum computing, I think they use a quantum effect of theories to uh, uh, compute. And also, they use it for uh, the, um, the encryption. This is really great. Quantum is very unique, though. If you start measuring, it changes. The so famous uh, Schrodinger is a cat uh, uh, the analogy. So if you poke it, then uh, it changes. So this is perfect for encryption. Yeah. So encryption is uh, one of a very, very tight uh, uh, protected technology, one of the military application too. If you watch the movie about Alan Turing, mm -hmm. he contributed a lot to uh, the decipher the, uh, the uh, enigma, right? Yeah. So the, that has the heritage. So that's quantum computing. Quantum the encryption is a very, very <laughs> military. It has a huge military capable, I mean, potentials. Yeah. So, the, so quantum computing, the theory is that you can run processes at the same time simultaneously, right, which right. makes basically, in a layperson's term, creates an ultra fast, ultra fast and an ultra secure the encryption. So if you start to break it, it's already changing because you are doing a measurement. So that's a, one of the quantum theories. So. But it can also be used for decrypting. Oh, uh, of course, of course. So is it if if so now a future president of the United States thinking about selling a quantum computer to say to to, to a country like China, right. is that were pr past presidents balked at that? Should future presidents not? It's it's an interesting and an important question, but uh, two reasons to think it's not going to matter. The first is that it used to be the case that military investments uh, created these enormous leaps forward in technology and private industry is driving that now. So, so the, the governments are going to struggle to keep up with industry innovation to even understand what to be able to restrict. Hmm. Um, that's increasingly a problem in the United States and I'm sure for all the other countries. The second piece of it is that um, it's very hard to predict what's actually going to turn out to be useful. For example, one of the celebrated cases of the failure of export controls was in the 1950s. The United States allowed uh, the, Russia, the Soviet Union to buy ball bearings, and that dramatically increased the precision of Soviet missiles. Mm -hmm. Nobody anticipated that that was going to be the outcome. And I think those kinds of problems are much more, um, much more likely in an area as fast moving as biological sciences or as fast moving as IT is. Okay. Did you have any? Well, it is true that um, uh, the US leads the whole industry in terms of AI and encryption. The encryption has a huge impact on military application. In the future, already happening, we like to use the uh, remote armies, right, remote aerial vehicles. Even civil application, we have a big issues about the civil UAV 
when you see, we are talking about huge airplane fly autonomously, and then uh, we need to have this kind of communication. So the, we are very much worrying about the security of this remote channel. It will be even more so in, in the military application. Suppose you want to have an army of robots. You can't, it doesn't have to be uh, the, the Terminator kind of thing, but um, uh, that uh, the arm, uh, unmanned ship, unmanned aircraft, unmanned uh, armor vehicle, you need to have a remote control. It has to be secure, and uh, the quantum yes, encryption is uh, perfect for that application. So it's very hard to break. And uh, it's already being used. It's not the future, it used to be future, but now it's people already using it. And I think uh, China is uh, very much of a leading uh, co country in terms of uh, this uh, computing and this information technology. So uh, US may be able to uh, do their, their you know, blocking of this uh, export, but sooner or later they will catch up. So. When you hear countries talking about placing some of these limits on these export controls, is that, in some cases, is that, is that trade protectionism by just a, a new fancy name? Yes. yes. <laughs> in lots of cases, it is. Um, and uh, just as you see with Interpol warrants, governments using them for, to target political enemies. They are gaming an international system whereby everyone has agreed to help each other police um, bad behavior. And you see the same thing uh, with a lot of the kind of trade controls. Okay. Do you have a? No, no. It's... No, not that one. Um, so so uh, Dr. Russell in 2016, he uh, championed an open letter uh, calling for a treaty banning lethal autonomous weapons. Uh, he said, starting a military AI arms race is a bad idea. Uh, he's, he's a very well-respected uh, researcher and in, in, uh, name in his field. Why is he, it's unfair to ask him without, <laughs> ask about yeah. it without him here, but why is, it, why is that misguided? Why do, why do we not worry about sort of the AI arms race? I don't think it's misguided, and I think we should worry about it. I struggle to see how practically to do so. Okay. Um, so uh, there are lots of innovations that turn out to have a very effective military applications, and it's easy to see how AI will have, right? Because if you think about the, uh, giving one military the ability to make a million decisions in a second, and everybody else struggling at the human rate of decisions per second, which is probably somewhere around one, <laughs> that's an enormous advantage, and there's no practical way to prevent it. So yeah, it's a future I would like not to see, mm -hmm. but I don't see a practical way to do it. And the only practical way I can think of to do it is to prohibit artificial intelligence in its entirety. Mm -hmm. And that means you will rule out so many enormous advantages for, for, human, for, for the upsides of human life. Drug innovations, um, the ability to make cars safer on the road, all those sorts of things that we're already benefiting from. So I think that ship has sailed. I don't think you can practically do it. I agree it would be a nice thing to do if you could do it. So uh, I actually went to UC Berkeley for my PhD, and I did work with Professor Russell at the time when I was a student. I really uh, look up to him, and uh, he's a great, great mind, and uh, he's a uh, very active, very brave to do all the things. You know, it's, even in the professors, um, it's very hard to make a voices like that. So I really admire what he's doing. What he's worrying about is a uh, proliferation. So if you, the AI just said, anybody can use it without knowing the consequences. So, because it's so easy to use. You know, early in this year, and maybe, I don't know, it's good I to talk about it, but um, bring it up. But um, Kais was, had a very, very unsolicited uh, fame in the AI field because uh, there was some uh, misguided uh, advertisement that uh, Kais, some researchers are working on the AI for defense. So um, that was a, um, uh, partially uh, um, the in, well informed. So uh, it was a big issue over the world. So many leading AI researchers uh, boycotted KAIS, uh, the uh, collaboration. So what happened was that uh, there was a military company in Korea. And as you know, Korea is divided. So military, uh, so the development is a huge issue. So uh, scientists or researchers like me sometimes even take pride in the working on that kind of area mm -hmm. to aid uh, our national defense. 
And uh, the, there was some, uh, some, some line that saying that uh, KAIS is developing AI power defense of something like that. So uh, it was kind of a, uh, they don't know what they're really doing, uh, what they're talking about. So in, in the in UN meeting, there are like an annual meeting. There was a recent meeting in August, and uh, I, w I was there last year, early this year. What they're talking about is that um, there are three voices over there. One is, let's just abandon it right now, for, because they're, those are typically countries, they have no AI activities. There is the other extreme, and uh, there are countries saying that let's develop it nice and well, you know, with the proper, you know, precautions, proper procedures, and we can make a nice working AI system. Some of the in the middle, they're saying that, no, oh, you know, this is a great technology, but um, let's be very careful. But let's not talk about not working on it. So let's, let's work on it, but um, let's be careful. So there are three voices, and uh, they all, all say that we have to assume that there is a meaningful human control, meaningful human control, saying that their key idea is that the AI should not left alone to make the critical decision, especially kill or you know, not kill decision. That this is their, their key issues on that. So, but um, you know, in Korea, it's a, it's, a, it's a mandatory to serve in the military. So mm -hmm. I served my one month as a special researcher uh, a program. But if you really go there, soldiers are not really meaningfully making decisions. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, there's a famous talking that in Vietnam War or even Korean War, they're shooting rifle like this. It's not very meaningful to me. Yeah. They're just uh, shooting the bullets out for any random direction, and uh, it's not very meaningful. So. Um, so we are talking about some of the conundrum, this kind of a, the endless loop that uh, the AI, the, they, the, you, you mentioned a few times, that the, the reason they're trying to make AI in, into the defense is that it is better statistically. So in, in, in 2012, there's a famous uh, professor in Stanford, Fei Fei Li, she's a Chinese, and uh, uh, she, uh, she demonstrated that um, uh, the computer can make a better image classification. Many of the military soldiers' job is to identify friends or foe and shoot the missile or not. So if, if the machine makes a better decision statistically, faster, why don't you delegate it? Especially when you are talk, sitting at a computer screen trying to control the drone, you know, half the, half the around the earth, communication is hazy, and you're trying to see, oh, if this is a human or not, with the limited bandwidth, or you're going to let the computer on board with the clear 4K UHD vision running in real time to make the decision. And we already know that the machine is more accurate than humans are making the image classification. This is where the problem starts. Mm -hmm. So, but, yeah. No, I'm sorry. Uh, the parallel is to self-driving cars. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Everybody's afraid that they're going to be a huge danger. In fact, because they don't get tired, because they don't get distracted, they are likely to be much safer than human decision-making in driving cars. And so we are letting our fears of an outsized negative outcome that's extremely unlikely outweigh the enormous advantages of fewer highway deaths in the United States, for example. Yeah, I'd like to add on that uh, autonomous driving for civil application, this is also the life or death situation. So if you turn the wheel left, people die, turn right, uh, you know, something other uh, crashes. And this is, but the, if we are willing to delegate driving, why not military decision? That's, this is uh, one of the extension of the argument. I'm, not that I'm supporting of it, but um, this is a, one of the very logical questions we have to ask. So if, if the countries that are sort of at the forefront of developing AI technologies, China and the US is what people generally argue, you would both say the cat's out of the bag, the ship has sailed, whatever other metaphor I want to strangle, that uh, there shouldn't be limitations placed on the military, the export of those technologies just because they might be repurposed for military uses. If that's sort of a fair read of your position, I'm going to put it to the test right now in the room and see how many folks agree with that. So do people understand sort of the premise that 
they're arguing that there should be no limitations placed on the export of artificial intelligence. Not that there should be no limits, but there's that not there are no practical limits to place. Okay, so this is going to be a, a, a quick poll of the room. Do you think we should attempt to place restrictions on artificial intelligence, uh, the export of artificial intelligence, out of fears it could be used for military purposes? So yes to that. So the, the rest are no. <laughs> So no limits on, a, on the export of artificial intelligence. Interesting. Uh, let's open it up for questions at this point. We have a microphone, I believe. Um, directly behind you. <laughs> oh. oh, I think we just have to wait for the mic. Is there? Oh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Go back here. And if you want to introduce yourself, if it's relevant, your affiliation. Hi. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name's uh, Joanna Bryson, and I'm a, a professor of artificial intelligence and I do a lot of work in AI ethics. Um, and I, I uh, really appreciate the discussion. Uh, it's really great. It's a, it's a shame that Stuart Russell wasn't here too, but I think you guys have done a great job. Um, but I, I want to uh, slightly disagree with one of the things uh, that you were saying about the impracticality of uh, global regulation. Uh, so you were saying that the problem with global regulation is it restricts what we can do. And I, Regulation is not only about restriction. Actually, often we upregulate. We actually fund some things. But in particular, in artificial intelligence, I don't think we're restricting. Um, the goal isn't about what algorithms we should release, although, of course, we know that we, there's been controversy, for example, on, on encryption algorithms, what can be released. But I think what's more important is that we need to be regulating accountability. And we need to come to global uh, negotiated uh, answers about how do we maintain human and corporate accountability through software. So right now, there's a lot of smoke screens around AI. If you think of AI as a person, like a legal person, then you can use it as a sink where there is no ethics and there is no accountability because a machine will never care if it's in jail. But if we say, no, we don't accept that, it is always some human who is accountable, then actually AI can increase accountability and, and it can lead to benefits even in the battlefield, but certainly in driving, as you were saying. So I think that was the one thread that's missing is about what are we, what are we looking for, for regulation? I think it should be how we handle accountability. I love that suggestion. Let me ask you to take it one step further and tell me how to do it. Right. So how do we, for example, how do the American and Chinese governments make each other confident that there's accountability in the AI development? Right. Okay, so there's a, there's a huge issue there, which is um, partly hacking. You cannot talk about any technology, including AI, without having cybersecurity. So how can we really demonstrate that we have done the sorts of things that we say that we've done? And there, there will be, it is um, probabilistic. Uh, so when you have cybersecurity. Having said that, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm sure there's better people to talk about cybersecurity than me in the room. What I'm really good at is AI. <laughs> and what we need to do is set standards about understanding, and we can do this within our own nations for liability. So standards about saying, you need to be able to prove due diligence. You need to prove that what software library you were linked to what data library you use for machine learning, what procedure you used to build your system. So people have been saying, oh, we don't know the weights in deep learning. We don't know how can we hold it accountable. We don't know the synapses of an accountant's head either, but we don't look at that. We look at the accounts. And so basically, if we just demystify AI, get a little more technological uh, knowledge and realize that we can go through, we can log the system by which we develop the software, and then hold people accountable for following good and safe procedures, which they have not been doing to date, right? And that you can read like uh, Frank Pasquale, The Black Box, to see the incredible mess that's being made with the data that we're using for training AI. Um, a very interesting suggestion, yeah. thank you. So sure. let's just follow up, does that, anyone in the room have a uh, suggestion for Corey and for David about a sort of mechanism for, if this is something that we think is a good uh, ambition to have, to have some sort of check on the system as was just discussed, what's the mechanism for that? Do we have the microphone? Let's go right over. Um, I was actually thinking 
um, we're talking about technology is neutral, right? It's really about the intent of the people we're trying to regulate, which uh, I, I, I totally agree with the, the guest was speaking of there. I was thinking about, is that something we could learn from the gun control in US, which is, you know, it's a more parallel here. Um, is that something like ID, ballistic curve, you could track the guns and also some licensing requirement to track those AIs which has, you know, has a little um, impact. So this might be something to think about. Thank you, that's a good suggestion. David, is that, is that a practical uh, way to approach this? Uh, there are procedures uh, they have to execute to develop the uh, certain um, we weapon systems, is what they call the uh, CCW, the conventional, certain conventional weapon systems. So one of them are nuclear weapons. And now the AI is joining that level of the uh, threat. Uh, some people perceive as a threat. So uh, we have to execute that kind of uh, the procedures to uh, make it make it make it work uh, correct. I think that's very uh, good point. That uh, technology is always neutral. It's only a uh, humans. Uh, we put in put them into what situation, what application. We use a GPS uh, every day, and the GPS is definitely military system that turn into civil, and uh, we cannot live without it, but um, uh, it has a very definite uh, military heritage. So, but the GPS is only telling where you are, so it's not gonna kill somebody. So, what the AI is really uh, people are worrying about is it is making the decision. So that's the, that's, the, that's the part people are very concerned about. Okay, excellent. I'm gonna go right over here in the green. In the green here, please. Thank you. And if you can introduce yourself. Yes, hi, I'm Anusha. I'm a global shaper from Lahore, Pakistan, and I'm a human rights and technology lawyer. Um, so there have been suggestions that, you know, for example, if somebody is employing robots or technology, um, that robot should pay taxes as well. So how far do you think um, an economic argument of that sort um, justifies the use of technology in that way? And I think it was, was it Bill Gates who suggested taxing? Yeah. Taxing robots, I think that would be. Yeah. Any response on that? Well, is it, okay. Well, I think the the AI can create a lot of a, they can do a lot of, a, of work. You know, they do very really great great job. So, I think uh, they are talking about the having uh, some tax on it. Or <laughs> I think uh, it makes some sense. But, uh, but um, I think we have to discuss how we're gonna really uh, see happens in yeah. the future. It's sort of one step towards the, what was discussed earlier about thinking of AI systems as human in some way so that they have some level of accountability. Accountability in warfare right. and accountability when tax day arrives. Too. So when you take account accountability, uh, we had this kind of discussion in the, uh, the civil aviation. We like to, they discussed about having a autonomous aircraft. We may be able to see it as autonomous uh, air taxi. China is a leading country on that. There was uh, one com company in Yihang. They made uh, human passengers or pilot uh, flew that thing. In the future, they're going to be autonomous. Uh, they expect. Uh, and the ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, banned autonomy for the time being in the, in the civil aviation. The reason why is uh, there is no accountability. So someone asked a very nice question. Human pilots can be even more unpredictable but the why do we allow humans to fly their plane when the AI is not? <laughs> so, right, so it's just the this, burden of proof. Yeah, we are, we are at this level of discussion. We never <laughs> thought the AI can fly anything, but now we think it can fly. It really, it really is true, and I'm, a, I'm an engineer on that part. Trust me, I, you can make it fly. And the, the, the answer I thought is this. We can ask a pilot, hey, why are you flying in this way? Even if he's in a very bad way of doing it, you know, in from the last few years of uh, accidents, AI don't answer why he's doing or it or she or whatever, you know, pronoun is for, but um, uh, is doing it. But um, we can ask humans. Maybe he's lying, but um, uh, he, he is answering. So this is a basis on but it. But I think a lot of the fear about autonomous aircraft and things comes from the likelihood of hacking. hacking if someone yeah. can interfere and you don't yeah. have a human to say, whoa, wait, this doesn't look like it's supposed to look, right, um, right. and override. Yeah. So a human in the loop or a human on the loop 
who's constantly right. being able to reassess or developing autonomous feedback loops that, that send alerts. The hacking is, is really a big issue. And they, that's the reason we talked about the little encryption technology in the beginning of this session. Uh, it is a really big issue. You know, it, the current uh, setup of the civil aviation, we say that the airplane has to be remotely piloted to allow the meaningful human control. The, this allows the, uh, the vulnerability to the system. The hacking is very hard. You, you, you're, you're probably assuming the hacking on software, but it's very difficult. But then we are letting humans to remotely control. We are actually opening a bigger door for problem because anyone can send a radio signal that can be interpreted as uh, the legitimate control signal. Right. Then you, we can have, God forbid, 911 in a global scale yeah. without any terrorists going on the airplane. I think it goes to this point about accountability though, right? Yeah. If there's a human in the loop, you can say, you can put that person on trial for mm -hmm. their judgment. Right, right. You, and so groping our way towards systems mm -hmm. of accountability in autonomy, I think it's a really important question. I want to take tack back to one other element of her question though, which is um, this fear about massive job loss associated with artificial intelligence and with robotics. It's certainly going to be true. Uh, it, most of my job can be done by a machine <laughs> and, and probably better than I can do it. And that's also true for lots of other people's jobs. But what technological pessimists miss in this is that the same thing was true during the Industrial Revolution. The same thing has been true. What, what technological pessimists underestimate is that a whole new economic ecosystem is going to grow up around robotics, and we're going to find new constructive things to do, things that we haven't imagined yet that need doing that people will move in and do. So we shouldn't believe that just because robots are going to take our jobs that those are the only jobs that are ever going to exist or the only jobs that people want to do, right? Compared to, um, so in the five century history of the Shaki tribe, I would have been scything wheat, which is hard work. I'd have been a stevedore. Uh, I'd have been a longshoreman. I like my job way better than all of those jobs that technology replaced previously. And I think we should at least imagine that the likelihood is going to be the same in this next revolution. Okay, let's take a question from this side. Do we have a question on the side of the room? Nope, moving back. We had way. one right there. Okay, right here. So I, I guess your, um, uh, what you said about the practical barriers to regulation of, uh, of these technologies can be applied to a lot of things uh, as well. And so in science, we have the precautionary principle. So shouldn't the onus and the burden be on those using that technology to prove that it is in public interest versus using the approach that, that you suggested that, well, it's because there's so much opportunity for, for positive use or there's positive impact um, to not, for us to not make use of that. Um, so. So shouldn't it be the other way around? That's a fabulous question. And American law um, since the, so the Patriot Act when in 2011, I'm not quite sure of the date when this came into effect, but that is the nature of American law for, for scientific research that has military and deadly applications. Um, but it's very hard to determine what that is. It's even in the case of biological agents that could, that could cause pandemics. It's, it's very difficult to make a real-time judgment. It's not that hard to make a forensic judgment after the fact, but in real time as the nature of science progresses. And the biggest impediment to those kinds of restrictions have been scientists themselves who see also the upside of these many things. So the precautionary principle, if it prevents a cure for Parkinson's disease, for example, there's not just the negative burden of proof, there's the positive burden of proof. So yes, you're right, um, and American law is structured that way where dangers can come out, 
but as a practical matter, it's extraordinarily difficult to judge that in advance, other than the judgment of the scientist herself as she's figuring out what she's doing. The, uh, I'm just going to moderate his prerogative to take a, a quick question. The, uh, are the ethics different of being a military pilot who might uh, launch a strike directly from a plane and being someone in a military capacity of approving a strike that a drone, an AI-powered drone has sort of identified a target, then it becomes an approval process, yes or no? Are the ethics of those two jobs different? Well, the burden of responsibility ultimately rests with the person making the decision. So, for example, uh, a celebrated war crimes case in the United States where a commander was woken up in the middle of the night and asked and given the information about what was known about a particular party and, and determined yes. That commander made his decision in about four minutes. Um, when asked by the investigating authorities, uh, the war crimes investigating authorities, they asked him how long it took him to make that decision, and he said it took him the 42 years of his <coughs> military experience. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's harder than it looks as a practical matter, but yes, in, in military, uh, in the American military, there is always a human who has to take responsibility and an investigation that can easily be triggered into the judgment that they exercise. I like to, uh, there was an interesting comment from a U.S. lawyer last year in the U.N. meeting. He made, a, it's his idea, but uh, so I, I need to comment that. Um, so he said um, AI can be actually uh, sometimes a better decision maker because it does not put its, uh, itself as the uh, variable to compute the good or bad. The humans sometimes make a bad decision because he's involved. So making a selfish decision Absolutely or right. Or the other way around, With very AI, sacrificial. I think, though the yeah. challenge is yeah. magnitude, right? right? So a commander wakes up, gets woken up in the middle of the night in four minutes, right. she has to make a decision. She makes it, you're talking about 20 people. Right. With AI, if you're talking a million decisions a second, mm -hmm. um, the scale of being wrong mm -hmm. and tracing back to who right. programmed that algorithm mm -hmm. and how do we put her on trial for the million decisions and in a second. And what if it's a group of people that program that algorithm? Yeah, it's, just, it's a very hard problem. I agree it should be done. I'd love to see it done. I struggle with how practically to do it. Okay. I so guess uh, one of the examples we can think about is autonomous car. They, they say sorry, that autonomous that? car, when mm -hmm. it hits people, so, you know, eventually people die. And um, they say the car manufacturer, or to be exact, who wrote the algorithm, would be held responsible. That's what people think these days. So a similar thing can happen for military. Too. But the issue of risk tolerance also comes in, right? The Geneva Conventions, for example, permit civilian casualties as long as they are um, in the context of achieving a legitimate military objective and are proportional to the objective achieved. So, so that's a wider risk tolerance than we're likely to accept in most civilian applications. And so the context really matters for this, which is what makes it so difficult to think of global solutions to these problems. Mm -hmm. Did we have another question? Uh, in the back row there. Hello, uh, I'm Risalat. I'm a, a global shaper, and I'm from Bangladesh. Um, so in the context of the global solutions, I just wanted to bring up another dimension and get your thoughts on that, which is the power of norms and kind of having that discussion together. Um, and I think when we know that the stakes are so high, um, I think I see a real lack of that conversation happening on a global level and the kind of deep forms of multilateralism that we need to... Uh, kind of move towards in order to address these challenges. So I just wanted to hear um, how you see that conversation developing and what opportunities to have that conversation on a global scale. Can I actually just, what, where do you think that should happen? I think at the level of the UN. The um, UN? Yeah, because member states are there and I think all member states see that these are really great challenges and there are many, right? So uh, what are those norms that people can agree, like member states can agree in the collective global interest uh, in, in light of those challenges. 
I agree that norms are really important and perhaps the most important restraint in a web of, of regulation and law and international practice that can develop. Um, and I think we're only at the very start of it. The Google case that Nancy mentioned I think is really important um, because uh, peer pressure among scientists and engineers about what are we willing to do and what are we not, who will we do it for and who will we not do it for. Uh, the problem with AI parallels to some extent the problem with the developers of nuclear weapons, right? Most of the people who went to work on the Manhattan Project to develop nuclear weapons were world-class scientists. Many of them were also refugees to the United States and were working on a project that they otherwise might not have because they were worried that Nazi Germany would develop nuclear weapons before uh, the United States, Britain, and Canada did. And yet, when Nazi Germany surrendered, the Manhattan Project continued. Only one person resigned when, from the Manhattan Project because by that time, people were so excited by the science, were loving the community of interaction that they had together. So even in that case where you had very strong norms, and then most of those scientists were shocked to see the consequences and the uses that the research they had done had been put to. So I think that's one of the challenges of norms. It's very hard to imagine the, the eventual uses of science and technology. But there are norms that scientists and engineers can develop that bind the range. We have not seen that be effective so far, especially the place where I am most nervous about norms not emerging is in biological developments, not in IT developments. Because there, we've had several celebrated cases, uh, Science Magazine publishing articles that, for example, the American government believed created a wider accessibility to very dangerous knowledge, um, so the proliferation. So it's very hard to do, but I agree with you that we're at the start of a conversation about norms and personal accountability for what gets developed. She's absolutely right that um, there are UNs that are having meetings right now. I mean, it's three times a year. and. Uh, they are trying to come up with the norms, and I certainly I observe that um, it's hard to come up with. I mentioned there are three different approaches or opinions about AI. Uh, they are getting there, but um, even in the hum eth human ethics, in the part of the world, we have a slightly different ethics. You know, basically, "Thou shall not kill" applies to almost everybody, but. Um, there is a certain uh, variation to kill who in, for what occasion and what is okay and what is not okay. So for, uh, this is a very uh, uh, common fodder for science fictions, but um, AI will be confused. <laughs> and there's a lot of concern yeah. by countries outside of the leading edge of AI development. So if you're not China or the U.S., um, many countries, this came out in previous rounds of UN discussions, many countries worry that we are going to figure out how to do this and then prevent everybody else from doing it. To, as Nancy suggested, to lock in the advantages of the first mover and all of the positive mm -hmm. elements will accrue to the first movers. Okay. We have time for one more quick question. I think, if, did you have a question? Oh, who do we have? There was one. Oh, back here. And we do need to keep it <laughs> a bit concise. Thanks. I'm Hal Olson. I'm the Economist Technology Correspondent. A question for the panel, but particularly for Corey. Do you worry about the strategic and security implications of what seems to be a nationalistic race around artificial intelligence and machine learning technology, particularly between China and the US? Uh, yes, I absolutely worry about it. And it's one reason that so I worry about it in two ways. The first way is that um, in free societies, our vibrant um, de public debate about these issues 
has the potential to put us at an asymmetric disadvantage because our engineers will refuse to do stuff for our own government, as the Google case shows. And they are not holding the Chinese government to the same standard they are holding their own government to. Uh, so there's the potential for asymmetric advantage as it becomes nationalistic. The second thing is, and I think our trade, uh, the spiraling up of trade restrictions, the spiraling up of concern of China as a military challenger to the existing rules-based order mean that the governments are going to uh, start screening scientists out of projects that are federally funded. They are going to stop funding um, foreign research. They are going to give preferential research to like-minded countries, which the Australia group already does. Um, that is, the, the 34 countries in the Australia group already do. So, so yes, it's, it is problematic. I also think it is largely inevitable because you cannot insulate something this potentially advantageous as a weapon from being seen in nationalistic terms. One quick lightning question, and then we need to wrap up. We've talked about artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, and quantum computing as sort of the, the next, the cutting edge, semi-cutting edge technologies that will have military applications. What are we going to be talking about at this forum five years from now as the what someone like me might see as sort of the scary cutting edge of uh, military applicable technologies? What should I worry about next? Uh, first of all, five years is really a sh sh long term for AI. <laughs> You know, I was amazed that the, in typical academic academia, it takes one year or more to circulate an idea, write a paper, you know, accept and not accept, and then uh, it takes a year. There's something called the, uh, you know, an archive, you know, with the X there, and uh, they exchange the idea in the time constant, what you call is a one week. Mm -hmm. It's one week, and uh, they upload the whole code. Anybody can download, they can branch from it, they comment on it. So the, the cycle is extremely fast. And yeah. the, the, the typically it takes, like they say, six months or shorter to completely recycle an idea. So five years a lot. And, I, and one thing I, I'm sure, I mean, one thing in AI axiom is don't make prediction. If, because after five years, you'll be a laughing stock. Okay. <laughs> but, but, but the one thing for sure is it's going to be tremendously fast. And then yeah. uh, we'll see AI used almost everywhere. And the uh, military will not be an exception. Okay. Yeah. Worry about the life sciences. I think the big surprises are going to come out of biology and the life sciences, oh, great. not out of IT. A whole new field for me to be terrified about it. Uh, excellent. Thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. I think we're going to be having this conversation for many years to come about the sort of uh, military applications of technologies and how much more complex they're getting. So uh, we'll, we'll reconvene here in a couple of years and, and, and parse them again. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, Rafael. Yeah.